Western science has just arrived at the understanding uh, that, that there is, in fact, a field of intelligent energy that connects everything, uh, certainly in our world, and it's believed beyond our world, even uh, the entire universe. Our science is only now uh, arrived at the understanding through the experiments and through the studies and the, the modeling of the equations that tell us, in fact, that field exists. So this is the place where we are now, and it's the place where the ancient, the indigenous traditions have always begun. They have always started from the place that we are part of everything, that, that we are part of a greater existence, that everything is connected. And they have devoted their time, rather than, than trying to explore and prove to themselves this existence uh, really is there, they devoted their times to understanding how to work within this existence. What does it mean to life and death? What does it mean to our time together in this world? If this field is really out there, can we communicate with it? And if we can, what is the language that it understands? Well, the understandings uh, in terms of Western science that this intelligent field exists in late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, is, is when the, the experiments actually confirmed what Max Planck in 1944 stated, the father of quantum physics, Max Planck, uh, actually said that the matter that we see in our world doesn't exist. It says the stuff we're made out of doesn't even exist, and the world that we see doesn't exist the way we believe it does. What he, he said was what we see as matter is here because of the existence of what he called a conscious and intelligent mind. And these are his precise words. And he followed that statement by saying that underlying this mind is the matrix of all matter. And this is the coin he termed in 1944. Of course, the movie uh, series was based on the, the studies that came afterward, but uh, it's actually been around uh, since the mid-20th century. So this field, the matrix, or the divine matrix, as it now is being called, is recognized as, as the field of intelligent, non-conventional energy. It doesn't work the way electricity or, or broadcast energy works. Uh, and perhaps that's one of the reasons it's taken so long for science to catch up with the fact that this is there, because our equipment isn't built to detect this kind of energy. Uh, on the one hand, the other hand, these ancient indigenous cultures, they detected it through the equipment of their bodies. They understood how to sense and feel and work and move in this field. So for me, I was trained as a scientist. And in my training, there was never an allowance for uh, the possibility this field could exist. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the last 100 years, science uh, has, has missed the mark twice uh, in terms of their explanation, the story that science gives of how our world works. And we're now paying the price for uh, where science got it wrong, essentially. And, and it's coming full circle. It's being corrected. But the first place that this happened uh, was with the belief that the space between things is empty. And now we know that nothing could be further from the truth. There's, there's a lot going on in what we always thought was empty space. But from the experiments that were performed in 1887, very famous Michelson-Morley experiments, to detect whether or not this field was there, when, when those experiments were interpreted uh, as, as proving the field wasn't there 100 years, over 100 years ago, from that point forward, our science has been based in the belief that everything is separate from everything else. What happens in one place doesn't have any effect on anything else. Uh, and that what happens in this lifetime uh, has nothing to do with any other lifetimes. And when we leave our bodies, there's nothing for our souls to travel into. And this is going to be important as, as we talk about some of the, uh, the implications of our time in history and where we're going. So this is the first principle where they got it wrong. And the second was that science, Western science, has believed firmly that the experiences that we have inside of our bodies, our thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, our prayers, our affirmations, in here have no effect on the world beyond our bodies. And now we know that these two assumptions are flat wrong. There is something in the nothing, and we do have the ability through our hearts, what is called coherent heart-based emotion, to create the fields in our bodies, the fields of our beliefs, of our thought, feelings, and emotions, that extend beyond our bodies into the divine matrix. So when people ask, what is the divine matrix? The, the way to answer that, it is the container for the entire universe. As far as scientists understand right now, everything that happens in this universe and in the higher dimensions of this universe are all within the context of this field, number one. Number two, that the divine matrix is a bridge between our inner and our outer worlds. It's the conduit that allows 
our prayers and our, our good wishes for one another to move from our hearts into this field uh, and, and be disseminated and distributed in the field in ways that we're only beginning to understand, in ways that appear to defy the laws of physics as we understand them today, and that's exciting. And number three, this field uh, appears to be a mirror in that the quantum soup of all possibilities, if you will, that exists as this field will, will mirror back to us. It's like a, a, a large projection screen that's everywhere all the time. It will mirror back to us what we claim to be true in our heartfelt beliefs, not what we speak as our truth, rather what we truly feel uh, is, is the, the, uh, the reality of the way our lives work, our relationships, the way our worlds work. What we hold in our hearts is our truth. Uh, this field will mirror it back, and where this gets really interesting is sometimes those truths that we hold are unconscious truths, and we're not even aware of what it is that we truly believe. We know what we like to think we believe, but what we truly believe uh, in our hearts sometimes is masked even to us. And it is through the wisdom of recognizing what the world brings to us in our everyday lives, our relationships, our abundance, our health, uh, our romance or lack thereof, uh, all of those things. Those are all mirrors, and the mirrors don't lie. They're mirrors in this divine matrix uh, showing us our, our true beliefs, what we claim to be true of ourselves in the world, our limits and our capabilities. This field, the divine matrix, of the many ways that scientists now describe the field and, and what makes it so significant in our lives uh, is the fact that, that, number one, through this field, all matter appears to be connected. And the word that science is using for this connection now is called entanglement. What entanglement suggests is that when something happens in one place in this field, in the divine matrix, it can be in another room next to us, it can be halfway around the world, that uh, the effects of that something can be felt almost everywhere simultaneously. So I, let me just describe what I mean by that a little bit. There was a, a very famous experiment that was done in 1997 made the, the cover of the scientific journals, but it never made mainstream public media. Uh, and I think here's the reason why. It sounded like a very technical experiment. But what scientists did at the uh, University of Geneva was they took a particle of the stuff our world is made of. It's called a photon, a little packet of light, particle of light, if you will. And they wanted two identical particles. So they took this one photon and they broke it into two. So both pieces had the same properties. And they had a specialized device where they could fire these in opposite directions at the same time, seven miles for one particle in one direction, seven miles in the other direction. When they reach their destinations, they're now 14 miles apart. They're using fiber optic cables to do this. And once those particles are at their destination, they can begin the experiments. And what they found was whatever they would do to one particle, in a moment in time, the other one acted like it just had the experience faster than it could have if this one were transmitting the information to the other one. Sometimes this one would act like it was having the experience before this one even finished its experience. They, they said they were tickling or disturbing the particles. They would ch uh, change the charge or change the spin rate or force the particle to go take path A or path B. But whatever they were doing over here, this particle always had the identical experience, as if they were still connected even though they were physically separate. And the reason this experiment is so important is it is now demonstrating to the scientific mind what the ancient indigenous traditions have always said, and that is once matter is physically connected, even though it may become separate and distant from where it was originally, it's always linked energetically always linked energetically, and here's why that's important. Because we live in a universe many light years in diameter, and we're made of particles that were once all converged into a single unit, a matter of, of fractions of a second after what's called the Big Bang, what scientists believe is the beginning of, of our universe. So if you could take all of the space out from between all the particles in our entire universe, many light years distant, and bring all those particles back together. Scientists say that, that we would take up about the, the, the space of a single green pea, very compact, very hot uh, uh, particles of matter. And this is where we were at one time. The particles of your body and our listeners and my body 
we were once uh, part of all the stars and we were once part of this Big Bang. And if we were once connected, even though we are now physically separate, the experiments suggest that the energy connecting us remains. And when I began to understand that as a scientist, it helped me to understand when I hear the ancient and the indigenous people say, we're all connected, we're all one, suddenly it began to make sense because my mind needed something to hang that nice thought upon. I wanted it to be true. I just didn't know in my training as a scientist, there was nothing that led me to believe that it could really be true. So the entanglement is one, one of the descriptions uh, of the nature of, of this relationship. The second is what is called a, a hologram or a holographic principle. And I, I, I wanted to, to lay the foundation so we could share both of these together. In a hologram, the definition of a hologram is that every piece of something mirrors the entire something, no matter how large or how small that is. Uh, so I'd like to give an example of, uh, of what that means. I'm a very visual person to help illustrate this. Um, back in the 1980s, there was a, uh, a series of bookmarks that came out in the, the New Thought community. Little shiny strips of foil that had images that were put there with a holographic process. And if you held them in the light just right, you would see that image actually come alive. It looked like it was hovering above, above your hand. And there, there was an image of the face of Jesus and Mother Mary, and uh, there was one of, uh, of a great pyramid and a dolphin and a rose unfolding. There were a number of them out there. Those little bookmarks, if you have one, you can do an experiment, but you can only do it once because it'll destroy your bookmark in the process. But if it's a truly a holographic bookmark, you can take that bookmark and you can cut it into a bajillion little pieces with a pair of scissors. And you can take the smallest one of those pieces, a little fleck under a microscope with an X-Acto knife and cut it in half, even again, and take that little fleck and look at it under magnification and you'll still see the entire image in that fleck, no matter how small, no matter what shape it is. And this is, by definition, this is the holographic principle. Every piece of the something contains the entire something on, uh, on a different scale of, of magnitude. And this is important because it is now believed that we are holographic in nature, that we mirror all that there is in this universe, that the universe is holographic in nature. Uh, William Blake said this so beautifully in, in his poem. He said, uh, the, entire, the entire world is reflected in a grain of sand. And it's more than a nice poetic uh, saying. There, there's truly uh, something to this, this fact. And it is, it is through the holographic principle that nature, it's one of the most powerful principles in nature and perhaps one of the least understood, because it is through the principle of, of the hologram and the entanglement that nature can create a lot of change in the entire universe by initiating that change in only one place. Because by definition of the hologram, every, every fragment mirrors the whole. So when a change is made in one fragment, that change is mirrored in the whole of a living hologram. That's important for us because it says to us that when we create peace in our family dinner table or in our communities, for example, that that peace is experienced in the hologram of consciousness of the divine matrix uh, in a way that extends much more than, than simply, or is not simply limited to, to our family dinner table or our, or our prayer group. Uh, and, and this is why our prayers, people ask me all the time, they say, if I, if I am praying for my loved one in the battlefield of Iraq halfway around the world, I can make a really good prayer, but how do I get the prayer over there? I mean, it's got to go a long ways. How, how do I get my prayer from here to there? And this is the beauty of the hologram. In the two particles that were separated by 14 miles, when one of them had its experience and the other one acted like it had its experience, scientists say, how did the information get from one to another? And in the hologram, the answer is it doesn't have to because it's already there. The information doesn't have to travel because it's already everywhere all the time. Our prayers, when we create them in our hearts for our loved ones, are already with them on that battlefield halfway around the world. When we speak to our loved ones who have passed over into, uh, into another world, what we're actually doing is we are speaking to the essence, their energetic essence, that is now within the layers or the higher dimensions of this divine matrix. And we don't have to, to pump or, or send our prayers into the eighth dimension or the ninth dimension uh, by virtue of being 
in our hearts because we exist in those dimensions as well. It's, it's already with them. The whole idea of, of dimensionality, 25 years ago, as a scientist, if I walked onto a stage and talked about anything in a live audience, talked about anything happening in higher dimensional state spaces, uh, there's a good chance it'd be la left right off the stage. And now, because scientists simply didn't acknowledge or mention much more than the three or four dimensions that we deal with now, uh, third dimension uh, is, is our physical world, and the fourth dimension being time and time space. There are a number of new theories that scientists are developing to explain and unify the laws of physics as we know them today. Uh, and this has been the great challenge of Western science, is we haven't been able to come up with one story that explains the entire universe, because our stories are fragmented. The mathematic stories of, of quantum physics or the mathematical stories of um, uh, Newtonian physics, they don't mesh. They, don't, they cannot work together to give us a coherent understanding of the universe. And where this may be changing now, scientists have come up with new theories, a number of different theories that are actually able to merge quantum and mechanic, uh, uh, quantum mechanics and the Newtonian theories together. Uh, the quantum theory saying that we live in a universe of energy, and the Newtonian theory saying we live in a universe of things. And it's the mathematics that describe the energy and the things they're trying to, to link together. Well, the new, theories, uh, the new theories are called string theories. And although there are a number of different string theories, 11 at least, there is now a, a super string theory that brings them all together. And the, the reason I'm saying this, what makes it so interesting, is for these theories to work and, and to unify the quantum mechanics and the Newtonian mechanics and the physical and the energetic world, to do that, the theories require that we live in a universe of at least 11 dimensions and very possibly 25 dimensions. They say they must be there for these theories to work. And what's so interesting is the higher you go in the dimensions, the simpler the mathematics become. And where everything looks separate in our three-dimensional world, in our polarity world, everything is. It's all, we live in a world of pluses and minuses, men and women, light and dark, hot and cold, black and white, true and false, uh, love and fear. We live in this polarity world. And this is where the mathematics do not work. And I would expect that they wouldn't work here because everything here is in that separateness. However, the beauty of these new theories and the way that they tie into the ancient and the indigenous traditions, both of life and death, and life continuing after death, what we call the death, is that they require this, this higher dimensional experience. And the higher you go in these dimensions, the mathematics becomes simpler and simpler and simpler, and they actually unify in the higher dimensions. Very, very simple mathematics. And the reason this is interesting is because what the studies now have shown is that when you and I have a feeling, coherent heart-based emotion in our feelings, those emotions are actually coherent. They're linked, they're in resonance with these higher dimensions where everything is one. So when we are having an effect, when we have a feeling and we see a physical effect in our world, it's not that our feeling changed something in this three-dimensional world. Rather, our feelings are speaking to the blueprint in the higher dimensions, and we're seeing the shadow of that change in our physical world. And this, to me, uh, uh, tremendous implications in terms of life and death, our soul, the seed of the soul, where do we come from, where do we go in between lives, where do we go after, after we die, do animals have souls? Uh, all of these questions, uh, these understandings now are bridging the language of science and the language of spirituality. And the ancient and the, the indigenous traditions have been here for 8,000 years in a very exciting new way that gives us this, this, uh, this very holistic picture of who we are and how we relate to one another and what life is really all about. To me, that's very exciting as well. A growing number of mainstream scientists within just the last two years, this is now uh, 2007, so 2006, early 2007, a growing number of mainstream scientists are now putting forward an idea that is uh, gaining tremendous momentum regarding consciousness, uh, who we are in consciousness, the nature of our physical reality, uh, and how things really work. 
And when, when we first hear about this idea, it almost sounds like science fiction. And then we ask, where does science fiction come from? Many times it comes from the intuitive hit of how the world works and what's possible, and then it becomes the reality of our world. What these signs are saying, MIT scientist Seth Lloyd, for example, in his 2000 book, Programming the Universe, literally is proposing that our entire universe and consciousness is either a computer in and of itself, that the universe is a quantum computer. This is what they're saying. Or if the universe is not a quantum computer, that the universe is the simulation that is being run on a big computer somewhere. And when I first began to hear this, you know, at first as a scientist, I think, you know, this sounds pretty out there. But I began to explore why mainstream physicists would, uh, at, at leading universities would begin to, to look at things this way. In my, my training, I was a senior computer systems designer uh, for Martin Marietta Aerospace during, during the Cold War years. So, it, of course, it's my language. But the more I began to understand, and I looked at the comparisons, every computer has a language that it uses to get things done. Uh, consciousness is the operating system of this universal computer, and belief is the language that it recognizes. Uh, every computer turns bits of information off and on to make things happen. And I said, well, in the universe, we don't have bits. And, uh, and I began looking at the comparisons, and they're looking at literally the stuff our world is made of. The atoms are the bits. When the atoms are turned on and in physical existence, they are reality. When they are not turned on, they are uh, un-atoms or anti-atoms or anti-matter that, that are not in existence. And they're, they're taking this uh, so seriously, this, uh, this proposition that we may literally be living a simulation of, of some kind, that they've done mathematic modeling to determine the probability that we are or are not living a simulation. And the, the mathematics suggest strongly that we are living in a simulation. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this here, I, I know it's a very different way of thinking about things. It sounds like the movie The Matrix, but where did that come from? The reason that this is important is because when we begin talking about the soul, what the ancient indigenous tr traditions say to us is that while a part of our soul uh, speaks and experiences through this body, we're not really here at all. That our higher self uh, is, is a part of a greater existence. And we always go like this, it's somewhere else expressing through this body. We've just come back from uh, uh, a tour in Australia, uh, and the aboriginals in Australia, as well as many other traditions, say this isn't the real world. This is the illusionary world. Uh, and, and they spend more of their time in what they believe is the real world, and what we would call the dream state. So all of this ties together when we talk about life and death, uh, uh, existence, consciousness, between lifetimes. Where do we go when we leave this body? Uh, from the perspective of these, these new ways of seeing things from uh, physicists and quantum physicists who are looking at this as a simulation, it's when our part of the simulation is over. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are gone forever. It just means that we're no longer expressing here and we're in those higher dimensions wherever this simulation is being run from. So it's a, it is a fascinating concept. And the more we begin to explore it, and, the, and when you look at the mathematics, and they plug in all the variables, they say it's more likely than not that we are actually living in, uh, in a universe that is, is the result of a massive simulation that's being run from somewhere else. Sounds like a Star Trek episode. Uh, Seth Lloyd is, is the man, the MIT uh, physics professor, who's developed the first feasible, viable quantum computer. And he said even in the infancy of our computers, a quantum computer is so powerful, it wouldn't take much more to model an entire universe on a quantum computer. And the thinking is that who or whatever is responsible for the simulation is probably uh, light years ahead of us in terms of technology. So, so to believe that they may have quantum computers that could manipulate the bits of matter. And it sounds very technical in some respects, uh, and it stretches us in some respects. And it also, and that's the purpose of films like this, to, we're looking for new ideas, new ways to think out of the box. Whether it is a reality, or even if it's only a metaphor, 
even if we only use this as a metaphor, it's a powerful metaphor that allows us to hang our beliefs upon because whether it is a physical reality or a metaphor that we live in a simulation, the bottom line is this, that if we understand the language that this reality recognizes, then we are no longer limited by the laws, the relative laws of physics as we know them. It means that we no longer have to suffer in our lives or age or we don't have to have the poverty and the disease. We don't have to have the war. If we understand the language, then we literally can rewrite the reality code that runs our uh, real or uh, metaphoric simulation. And to me, it's, uh, we need some new ideas to look at the world. Because what we're seeing now is, is so many people believe there's a single physical reality. And if you want to change it, you've got to go out there and hammer it into submission militarily, economically, uh, men bumping chests with men, you know, guys uh, with, a, with big armies and, uh, and a lot of power. And we know where that's gotten us. So it, uh, my feeling is that we need to think, we need new ways to think about our universe. And this is one of the most powerful and innovative ways that I've seen in a long time. And it's not so new just different language because this is what the ancients have always said. They said, you're not from here and that we don't live here uh, and that this world is a dream and that this world is an illusion. Uh, and, and then it opens up all kinds of questions. If this is a simulation, who's the architect? When did it begin? When does it end? And all of these have implications in terms of uh, life in this world, life after death, life from this perspective, Death just becomes a journey uh, into the homeland of where everything begins rather than the end of everything that we've ever known. So I, I, I can't help but imagine one day if, if this is either a, a dream, a simulation, uh, real or metaphorically, we'll just wake up one day and we'll look at each other and we'll say, what were we thinking? What in the world were we thinking when, when we did all those horrible things to one another? Yeah. But what, what we now know is when I was in school and when many of our listeners were in school, we were taught that this is a physical reality made of atoms. And our atoms would look like little solar systems. They were modeled as little solar systems, things in the middle called a nucleus with other things orbiting them like electrons. And, and those days are long gone. We now look at atoms rather than things orbiting around other things. We look at them as concentrations of energy in space and time where there are no clear-cut things. Now, where this gets imp important is that, that scientists, uh, and this is in the standard physics textbooks, this is no surprise what I'm about to say, is that if you change the field of energy that the atom lives in, you change the atom. You can change that field electrically, uh, or you can change it magnetically. And there are terms for the, the effects, the Zeeman effect, the Stark effect, are, are well-documented effects of uh, electrical and magnetic changes in the field that change the atom. Where, while it sounds technical and maybe not relevant, where it gets really relevant very fast, is our hearts are the strongest bioelectrical and magnetic field generators in our bodies. Our hearts generate stronger electrical fields than our brains. They generate stronger magnetic fields than our brains. Our hearts are 5,000 times as powerful magnetically than our brains. And we hear about EKGs of our hearts. They're up to 100 times stronger than the EEG, the electrical information in our brains. So when we create thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, compassion, prayers of forgiveness in our hearts, that's the words that we call those experiences. But to the field, what we're doing is we're creating electrical and magnetic waves in here that are now known to change the stuff out here. And in that way, we are linked. So when we talk about our universe, uh, possibly as a simulation, it tells us that we are not separate, that we are empowered not to control or manipulate or impose our will, rather uh, to participate as Princeton physicist John Wheeler suggests, to participate uh, in the way this reality unfolds, to participate in our personal growth and healing, uh, in the healing of our loved ones, to participate in the peace that happens in our families and between nations. And the, the little catch is that for us to share the beauty of this participation, we must work together and share those heart fields. 
And that, I think, is, uh, is where this learning curve is actually going. And we may not use that language. We don't have to understand all the technical aspects. I mean, people know that when you have a feeling, it, it may have an effect. But in our Western world, we need our mind, our, our left brain, our logic needs a framework to hang these very uh, subtle spiritual understandings upon. We'd like to believe them. We just need a reason to believe it. And, and the reasons are there. Uh, if, if we can take the understandings out of the very technical realm uh, and, and share them in a language that's relevant to, uh, to people that don't have that background. Science is only a language. It's a good language. It's only one language that describes our world. And there are many other languages. And I think, for me, this is the value of going into the monasteries of Tibet and Bolivia and Peru and Nepal. We've been in monasteries in Egypt uh, in their, their libraries, their records. For 1,500 years, people who have, li have lived the traditions and perpetuated and taught them, because we can look at them. I can look at another human eye to eye, heart to heart, God to God, in that moment, directly or through a translator. And I can ask them, human to human, I can say, when you just did that miraculous healing, <clears throat> what happened in your body to make that happen? How'd you do that? And if I don't understand what they say, I can ask them again and again and again until they either kick me out of the monastery because they're tired of my questions, or they will answer my question. And in this way, we learn from this 5,000-year-old uh, heritage uh, of our past, and we marry that with the best science of, of our day today. Uh, in the book, Small Miracles, there is an uh, amazing story. It's a, it's a true story, and I share it with our audiences a lot, uh, of what many people would call a miracle. And for me, it's, uh, it's a demonstration of just how real this field is that connects everything. It's the story of a young Jewish boy, his name was Joey, uh, who at the age, uh, I believe, of 19, suddenly woke up one morning, began to question 5,000 years of Jewish tradition. He began to question all of the things he'd been taught by his family, uh, and his father took it as a personal offense. He said, how can you question this, this lineage of, of, of wisdom and tradition? And Joey said, I've got to go out in the world and find out for myself if, if these things are true or not. And his father said, uh, if you turn your back on your tradition and you go out in the world and search for yourself, he said, you're no longer my son. I have no son. And Joey said, I've got to do this. And he, and he left. And he went into the world and he studied uh, in the ancient and in, in the, uh, the Eastern traditions, Buddhist traditions, uh, in the Jewish traditions. And he was in a small cafe, uh, and I believe it was in Paris. And you never know who's going to walk into those cafes. And a friend of his walked in from the States that he hadn't seen since he left. And the first thing his friend said was, I was so sorry, Joey, to hear about the death of your father. And it was the first Joey knew that his father had died. And so he immediately came back to the States and he began uh, speaking to his father's friends and their neighbors. And what he found is rather than turning his back on his son, his father had done just the opposite. He was so proud of his son for having the strength to question 5,000 years of faith. And he, he spoke about his son incessantly and honored his son's courage. And this led Joey back into the Jewish tradition that he had left to explore. Uh, and it eventually led him uh, in a traditional pilgrimage to the, to the Holy Wall in Jerusalem. And uh, if you've ever seen this wall, you know that it's made out of these massive uh, stone bricks that have been there for so long that the mortar holding them together has fallen out. So where the mortar used to be, there are empty spaces, and the tradition is to inscribe a prayer on a paper or a cloth, roll it up, and place, it, place your prayer in, into that wall. And this is what Joey was doing. He, he'd written a prayer to his father asking for his father's forgiveness for the pain that he'd caused and the suffering in the family. And he was pacing back and forth in front of the wall looking for just the right place where he would leave his prayer. And there was a place that caught his eye and as he was raising his hand to put his prayer into that place, the moment that he did that, another prayer that was already in there somehow magically fell out at his feet. And as he reached down to pick up the prayer that had fallen out, it was already partially unrolled and he, he already recognized what was happening here. It was a prayer in his father's handwriting that his father had written before his death and had come to precisely the same place and put in precisely that crevice in the wall that Joey had been drawn to. And as Joey read the prayer, it was a, it was a prayer from his father to God asking for forgiveness for turning his back on his son and how much he really loved his son and how proud of his son he was. And the reason I share the story, for two reasons. First of all, when we hear the story, there's a feeling. 
within us. I feel it every time I share it. That feeling is a language. It's a nonverbal language. And if I just simply said to you or to an audience, have that feeling right now, you might be hard pressed to do it because there's no reason to have the feeling. But when we hear stories like that, that feeling came from a place of innocence, uh, of emptiness, of non-judgment. You didn't know what was going to happen, but you feel a feeling when you hear that story. Number one. Number two, for Joey to find precisely the crevice in the wall where his father had been months before his death. There obviously, and for that, for him to be there that moment and for that prayer to fall out of the wall at his feet, and this is a true story, there obviously was a communication that was not bound by time or space, or in this case, even life and death. It was a message from beyond his father's life in this world. And for that to happen, there's got to be a conduit that carries that message. That's the divine matrix. That's the field that we're talking about. So we know that, that our, our soul, what we call our soul, uh, is, uh, is an energetic essence. There are a number of studies were done early in the 20th century, even trying to measure at the instant of death how much weight a body loses in their passing. And no matter if the person was a 300-pound man or a 70-pound woman, the, the amount of weight that they lost, I think it was uh, 28 grams, I believe is what it was, was the average. It was about the same. A lot of controversy around, uh, around the studies, and uh, I'm not sure they've been duplicated well. But the key is there, there is uh, apparently an essence within each of us that is not bound by this world. And when we ask the question in our mind, when that essence leaves our bodies, where does it go? Understanding that we live in a universe of at least 11 and probably 25 dimensions, and that this field of energy is made of a non-conventional field that doesn't work the way electricity or, or radio waves works, uh, all of a sudden, it's not so far-fetched to believe that we're part of that essence and that we can move and travel and navigate and maneuver through those fields when we're not inhabited uh, or inhabiting our, our bodies as, as we know them today. And it's giving a whole new meaning to life, death. Uh, when the ancients talked about heaven and their hands always went like this, were those heavens, and there are multiple heavens, were those heavens the higher dimensions? Was heaven the language they used 5,000 years ago for what our male-dominated, schematically oriented, left-brain technological society calls higher dimensional state spaces? Are we, are we talking about the same thing? So this is, uh, again, this is the value for, of going back into these ancient traditions and, and looking at, at the, way, the way they looked at the world through their eyes and asking what did they know maybe that we've forgotten. I had the opportunity a few months ago, uh, the last remaining Gnostic sect to survive into the 20th and now the 21st century is a sect called the Mandaeans. Uh, and interestingly enough, the location of their home has been the border between Iran and Iraq, right where Gulf War I and Gulf War II rolled right through them. And uh, I was in another country where many of the Mandaeans had fled uh, and one of the high priests asked to, to meet with me while we were, we were in this country. And, of course, I said yes. And he brought with him a scroll uh, that he says is over 6,000 years old. And it was written in Aramaic, which is interesting to me because Aramaic was the language of, of Jesus. Uh, and uh, we're not sure when it actually began. But what was interesting about this scroll, in our biblical traditions, the creation of humankind happens in a couple of sentences in the book of Genesis because we've got the Reader's Digest condensed version and a lot of things we know were edited out. In other traditions, such as the Mandaeans, they are in scrolls. So there is column after column, paragraph after paragraph of information describing uh, the creation of the human body first and how the powers that be then tried to put the soul into the body, uh, suggesting that our soul is in fact separate and comes from somewhere else. And what makes it so interesting is, is that the first few iterations of humankind could not hold the power of the soul or the spark or the light of God from this higher dimension. And it was only when they perfected the genetic recipe for the bodies that we have now that they could get 
the, the soul, and it, it always says when they created the body of Adam. It's not when he created the body of Adam. When they, indicating that there were, were multiple people, created or multiple beings, created the body of Adam, uh, they could not get the soul into the body of Adam at first. So into the male body of Adam, they placed the feminine soul uh, from a higher state space, a higher dimension is the way we can interpret this. And it was the marriage of the physical body with the feminine soul that gave Adam his animation and allowed him to become the man uh, that he was. And that, that uh, either metaphorically or uh, in reality, this is uh, the story that tells us that our bodies and our souls, while they share time together and are merged in this moment, that they are actually separate entities. And when we talk about life and death, here again we find in at least a 6,000-year-old tradition that there's something inside of us that's not from around here, that comes from somewhere else. And we begin to think about our universe and our lives as a simulation. Uh, it's saying essentially the same thing, that that we're projecting or experiencing through this physical body to find out something here about ourselves in this world that apparently we cannot experience in heaven or in these other worlds. And in these texts, they are what we would call plays of morality. It's, if you live in the eighth dimension and you wake up every morning in the eighth dimension and all there is is light, it's easy, easy to live in the light. But if you wake up in this third dimensional world, and you've got choices of light and dark and good and bad and right and wrong and males and females and all the things that go with that, then you have to choose. And, uh, and that's where it gets really interesting. So this is, uh, again, this is the value of going back into some of these, these ancient traditions because they had a, a language that was intact that describes our universe and who we are in a way that our science is only now beginning to understand. Whether the ideas proposed by the the physicists that we are somehow living a simulated reality are real or metaphoric. Again, for me, the bottom line is they suggest that we are living uh, in a universe and in a world that we're part of rather than separate from. And as part of our world, we are empowered to participate in our healing and in our abundance and in our peace. And I believe that that may be what this, this life is all about, recognizing, recognizing that there's a power within us that allows us to transcend the great suffering uh, and achieve the, the greatest joys that we could ever, ever want to experience. What that means to me in terms of everyday life is looking at the world around me through new eyes and recognizing that this world is nothing more, nothing less than a mirror of what we claim to be true in our hearts. And if we choose to live in a new world rather than trying to hammer it into submission externally, we can choose in our hearts to feel and believe uh, in, in ways now that our scientists say actually affect and change the, the reality of our world through what's called coherent heart-based emotion. They aren't just thoughts or wishes, feeling as if our bodies are already healed, feeling as if peace has already happened in our lives, uh, and giving thanks of appreciation and gratitude for whatever time we have together in this world. Because uh, real or simulated, we don't really know how long it lasts or how long we're here. So from my perspective, every day uh, I do my very best and I ask myself the question, what can I do today uh, to leave every place that I visit a better place than it was than when I got there. And whether it means cleaning up the sink in an airport bathroom before I leave because it looks better when I left than it did when I came in, or when someone stops me in the hall in a very busy conference to talk and I know I've got to be somewhere else, am I too busy to talk to them or can I give them 60 or 90 seconds fully present, fully focused and honoring and just say to them, I. I I, uh, I can only honor you for, for these moments and look them in the eye. Uh, in that way, these are the little things that we can do in our, in our day. Be fully present with everyone uh, that comes into our lives and crosses our paths and where we choose to travel and share our energy, leave that place a better place than it was when we left.